Well, hey there, and welcome back to Heimlich's History. Now, we've been going through Unit 8 of the AP U.S. History curriculum, and you didn't think we weren't going to talk about environmental issues, did you? You're so crazy. So that's what we're going to be talking about, environmental policy. And if you're ready to get them brain cows milked OPEC style, then let's get to it. So our learning objective for this video is as follows. Explain how and why policies related to the environment developed and changed from 1968 to 1980. And we're going to start by considering natural resources outside of the United States and what policies that led to, and then we're going to consider environmental environmental policies at home. Okay, so when we're talking about natural resources outside the borders of the United States during this period, there's one that reigns supreme above all else, and that is oil. And most unfortunately for the oil-addicted United States, much of the world's oil during that period came from a cluster of nations in the Middle East, and in general, the relationship between those countries and the United States was, to put it mildly, uh, strained. Now, much of the tension began with the creation of the Nation of Israel in 1948, and this is a very complicated thing, but for our purposes, it's going to be enough to know that Arab nations in the Middle East strongly opposed this move while the United States remained a tight ally of Israel. And in 1973, America's support for Israel cost them dearly with respect to Middle Eastern oil. Oil-producing Arab nations formed the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC, in order to better control the prices of the oil they exported. In 1973, they dramatically reduced oil exports to America and raised the prices on oil that they did export. As a result, fuel prices rose dramatically in the United States, and there was a significant shortage as a result. And it was at this point that American policymakers had to wake up to the reality that their chief energy resources were not under their control, and what oil they could get came from volatile countries that didn't like them very much. And so that led to a new conversation about alternative sources of energy for the United States. One option on the table was shifting our energy dependence to nuclear energy. And hey, what could be more American than nuclear energy? Like, we invented that ish. And then we used it to blow up hundreds of thousands of civilians in Japan, but you know, we invented it. And the thing is, nuclear energy actually had a lot going for it. The nuclear reaction required uranium, which was plentiful and cheap, and it doesn't produce any greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide as it's being processed. But there is a downside, and here's where I introduce you to a little place called Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania. In 1979, one of the nuclear reactors on Three Mile Island melted down partially, and tons of radioactive waste was released into the surrounding environment. But don't worry, it was in the middle of nowhere and nobody was in danger. Hmm? I'm getting word that it was not in the middle of nowhere and that it was in fact in the middle of a highly populated area and lots of people were in danger. Now, to their credit, the government worked with the local authorities to get it cleaned up and while it is disputed, there seemed to be no evidence of harm done to the surrounding population. Even so, this accident combined with the nuclear meltdown at Chernobyl and the Soviet Union put fear in many Americans' minds regarding the safety of nuclear energy. So at the end of the day, a national policy on energy, especially with respect to nuclear energy, would not gain much of a foothold. However, this incident gave fresh momentum to the already burgeoning environmental movement of the United States. One of the most significant books that got this agenda in the national consciousness was Rachel Carson's 1962 book called Silent Spring. In this book, Carson explained how modern society was in effect poisoning the earth, especially with regards to the use of DDT pesticides in modern agriculture. And then the environmental movement gained a great deal of exposure thanks to the celebration of the first Earth Day in 1970. And after the Three Mile Island accident, these folks focused especially on the dangers of nuclear energy. Now, as a result of these efforts, we finally get to some policy. In 1970, President Richard Nixon created the Environmental Protection Agency, or the EPA. The job of the EPA was to manage pollution control programs, including pesticides, oversee the regulation of industries that polluted, and much, much more. And despite the very vocal disparagement of its detractors, this was a decently popular move. And the truth is, the country was ripe for this agency, because only a year before, the Cuyahoga River in Ohio caught fire in 1969. And I did not not say that wrong. A river in Ohio caught fire. The reason it caught fire is because it had been so heavily polluted by factories upstream, and it actually caught fire something like 14 times. And so Americans reading about the environmental degradation by poisonous pesticides and seeing rivers on fire in the evening news got fed up and demanded environmental protection. So the EPA was one agency created by policymakers to address environmental concerns. Another policy to know is the Clean Air Act passed in 1963. This was a law that was aimed at controlling air pollution on a national scale, and once the EPA was was created, it took over the regulatory work of that policy. Okay, if you need more videos on Unit 8, then click right over here. And if you need help getting an A in your class and a 5 on your exam in May, then click right here in the review packet. And if you were in any way helped by this video, then don't regulate your finger from clicking that subscribe button, and I shall keep making them for you. Heimler out.